Good morning. Welcome to the 2019 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Jason Rayhout. I am a first year MBA student here at MIT Sloan, and I'm pleased to introduce this panel, an American analyst in London. Our panelists today are Ted Knutson, owner and founder of StatsBomb, and Daryl Morey, general manager of the Houston Rockets. The panel will be moderated by Roger Bennett, co-host of Men and Blazers. The panel will run for 45 minutes, and we will have 10 minutes at the end for questions. If you'd like to submit a question, please do so via Twitter using the hashtag American Analyst. With that, I'll turn it over to Roger right before a quick video. How you doing? This is Ted Lasso. I'm the new head coach of the Tottenham Hotspurs, and uh, I'd like to talk to the queen, please. My name is Ted Lasso. I'm new head coach for Tottenham Spurs. Been brought over here to, to you know, implement my coaching style. Football. Uh, so yeah, thanks for <laughs> <laughs> It's going well. Fire the demo guy. <clears throat> it's all right. We can just roll without it, I think. Alright. Alright, Roger, just go, I think. Yeah. Okay. That was meant to take 55 minutes. That yeah. <laughs> and we're going to have to play for time. That was Ted Lasso, the American coach who wanders into Premier League football, asks crazy questions, and is genuinely hilarious. I will say about Ted Lasso, if he was the coach of the US men's national team in the qualification for the last World Cup, the US men's team would have been in Russia. There's an American ingenuity that you bring to the game of football with your outside thinking that I'm hoping we can harness in the next 55 minutes with these two gents. I will say it's a great delight to be here at Sloan. I'm Roger Bennett of Men in Blazers, the most suboptimal soccer broadcasters in America. As we like to think of ourselves, we're the one thing holding the sport back from going over the top in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> football is the biggest sport in the world. It's got the largest global fan base, but from an analytics perspective, it's largely resisted the numbers game. I'm speaking to one of our panelists, the great Daryl Morey, over the last couple of weeks. He told me, if the NBA is 10 years behind Major League Baseball in terms of data analysis, soccer, whether that's the juggernaut English Premier League or lower down the food chain, MLS, is 10 years lower behind the NBA. Lower down the food chain? Yeah, food chain, bro. Um, we've got <laughs> few parallels to total quarterback rating, exit velocity, launch angle, metrics. <laughs> Ours are much more primitive. I mean, they're developing, we'll talk about how, but it's still largely a nascent field. I want to understand with you why that is, how it's changing, how it can change more, whether the success of analytics in other sports will propel football teams who are incredibly conservative. The big football teams in the world are largely risk averse, but both the big ones and the small ones to incorporate the thinking of quant stat-driven managers rather than the, the kind of former grizzled professional players which are uh, still the go-to move in teams around the world. Our panelists will have a wide-ranging and fairly wacky conversation. Um, it's, uh, we're going to look at the big picture ways soccer could change. The session will be released as a podcast on Men in Blazers. Joining me on the stage here are two superb, enormous brains in a bottle. The first, known to you all at Sloan, Daryl Morey, general manager of your Houston Rockets, and my favorite rocket since Sam Cassell. Was there some applause for Daryl there? That's lovely. Daryl, your parents are here. <laughs> Co-founder of the Sloan Analytics Conference, the best Sloan since Peterson. Uh, one of the gentlemen who's a pioneer of MBA analytics. I actually believe you're partially responsible for the invention of numbers. Is that right, Daryl? <laughs> I can't. I'd have to deny that. Oh. Yeah, I think that... Zero, though. We came up with zero we'll here, at, here at the Sloan Conference. We'll talk about Daryl's soccer bona fides in a moment, but we're going to say a word about the great Ted Knutson, another great American who grew up near Chicago, Illinois. Didn't kick a soccer ball until age 21, right? That's true. When he started playing with international students at the University of Oklahoma, his first touch still needs a bit of work. <laughs> But Ted's career in sports started with professional sports betting. From there, he started to work in football when former Danish champions FC Midland. Midland, current as well. 
I've found with foreign teams from Scandinavia, if you don't know how to pronounce them, just shout them in a thoroughly <laughs> angry way, and it's always pretty bloody close. They took advice from you uh, when you were head of player analytics for Smart Odds, the firm run by the club's owner, Matthew Burnham. He started to work more with his other team, Brentford, and then set up Stats Bombs an analytics and data provider for football clubs spanning the globe. My hope is we can talk for about 40 minutes about where we are right now in football in the never-ending battle between conventional, traditional gut-based wisdom in which I thrive and stats-based anal analysis in which these two gentlemen have, uh, have pioneered the sporting wave. It is, as I say, we're gonna fuse the outsider perspective of Daryl, wacky, some of these ideas, but this whole conference is fairly wacky, and you guys know better than I do how quickly wacky ideas become consensus. And my God, we need some more wacky ideas in football. We're gonna fuse them with the in insider perspectives of Ted. We'll then take questions from all of you. Daryl, I'm gonna begin with you. Okay. You told me Nervous. you're not a soccer expert. I'm definitely not. Proof of that is that you are an Arsenal fan. <laughs> There is not a single data point that would propel you to that heartbreaking decision. Are we always in fourth? <laughs> yeah, yeah, please God, fourth would be a lovely thing. But your groundbreaking work in the NBA, it got you talking to soccer and the analysts, the community of soccer analysts in Europe. And your conclusion, you told me, was their data sucks, no one cares, and no one should. And you said, if you were head of Chelsea, would I listen to the quants? No, I wouldn't. No. Why is that? I, I think just going through the evolution of, of the NBA, we knew, the one thing we figured out early is that we don't know enough. Like, and, and right now, especially when I was talking to say the folks at Chelsea, like say um, 10, 15 years ago, I was like, well, what do you guys have? And they're like, well, we have this, we have that. And I was like, well, doesn't everything turn to zero? Like every time something happens, you get zero. So how are you <laughs> concluding anything? Everything leads to zero. So I was like, step one. Because need... of the lack of goals. Ex ex exactly, like you can do everything right, you get zero. You can do everything wrong, you get zero. So it's very hard to differentiate. In the NBA, you go back and forth 100 times, right? And each time down, you get a pretty good distribution of zero, one, two, three, a lot of scoring. Americans are happy. It's great. <laughs> American and so, one. But that allows us to differentiate things. And so I, when I talked to them, I was like, well, you have to get to where there's a, some percentage of like whether you almost had a goal. And they're like, we don't have that. And I was like, wow. No, of course, we have that now, which is pretty cool. A little bit. Uh, yeah, we have a, a little bit of that. But the reality is it's a very complex sport, 11 on 11, lots of free moving, not a lot of set things. And, you know, I only listen to data when it really tells me something. And right now, the sport isn't there. Ted, I'm going to give you a moment to respond before we dig in. Has there been a revolution in football, in soccer, and just most fans and most television commentators are not aware of it? Yeah, I think we've seen, I mean, I would say the last two years we've seen expected goals start to appear on television. And that's, it's not the revolution, but it's the thing that you were looking for. At, Just to at explain Chelsea. what expected goals. So expected goal. goals is really, every time you take a shot, what's the probability of that shot becoming a goal? Now, Daryl would definitely say that our data is crap, and he's not wrong, but even now, like, you can say that the data is crap, but it's less crap than it was, and you can get a lot of useful things out of it. The gamblers, professional gamblers, have made an awful lot of money on this type of modeling, and so versus even a market perspective, like, that model gives you pretty good returns. Well, plus I'd say your hurdle rate is not this data is stuff you can go bet on. I mean, that's like the highest standard. You're right. putting your own money on it. You just need, at this point in the evolution of soccer, that having the data is better than not having the data. That's a much lower standard, and I think we're there in soccer, unless you tell me I'm wrong. No, I think that's true, and, and as, as we both know, it's a relative competitive thing. So if, if, all, the, if all the players were right in their opinions, and all the, <laughs> the historic pundits were right in their opinions, then we wouldn't have anything that we could add in data. But I would say that that's not the case. Only the analysts are right. Once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl, you tell me when you start to watch soccer, it helped you think about basketball, your game, in a different way. And what, one of your big takeaways was that you believe soccer obsessed too much about possession versus position. Yeah, so I get endlessly just frustrated watching, watching soccer, and I would say, 
you know, and, and now I know it has a name, the Tiki Taka style, is that a thing? <laughs> yeah, so where they're doing like these, and I was like, what, like, at the end of the day, you need to be in the offensive end to score, and yet we're making these endless passes with no advance, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of what we learned in basketball was that, that early on, everyone was trying to play in a beautiful way, right, even in basketball, the point guard was making passes to the open person. And we found pretty quickly with the data that doing things quickly and scoring early is, is, a, is a bigger advantage. Uh, it's not as beautiful. Taking really, really challenged shots if they're from the right zones is a big advantage. Uh, and not playing in this uh, way that's more aesthetically pleasing but just more brutishly effective with threes. So basically, you know, we're here to ruin soccer, basically. We're <laughs> just, just by giving us your opinion. Y you know, I'm just saying, like, <laughs> everyone thinks we're ruining basketball. So essentially, what I just said is, like, I want to, we need to make soccer less beautiful and more effective. Well, and, and those of us who've watched soccer over the years in, in Europe would say that there are plenty of times where it's been really not attractive, but Jose Mourinho has been the coach when he was, had good teams, and it was effective. Uh, but, I, you know, the possession versus position thing, I think you're not wrong in many ways. And we've looked at it from our perspective, and you know, we're starting to filter out, much like you found, that the threes and the dunks is a superior style of play. We're starting to get little bits of that, little glimpses of that. I wouldn't say that it's a, it's a cogent theory yet, but there are certain things that we know that we want to incorporate in our style regularly. Going fast is a big one, right? Like you yeah. want to, as many times a game as possible, you want to attack an unset defense. And so counterattacking is a big deal. Well, yeah. and, and it's like, you know, we're, I come to this conference every year because we just steal things from basketball. So, you know, we're, we're, maybe you're making us better already. My football club will be the launch and squish football club. <laughs> I would launch and press and squish and keep them in their end and look for turnovers. And, and it seems like that style is coming it's, when I watch. It's a very German that style. That style has also been, I mean, there's a gentleman called Sam Allardyce, who I believe is about 73% <laughs> made of pie products. I mean, he's an enormous gentleman and he specialized <laughs> In the early 2000s, he targeted what he called POMOS. POMOS, P-O-M-O-S, POMOS. And every time he was on the table, he'd be like, what, we've made a lot of POMOS. And we're like, what, what the fuck are POMOS? <laughs> and he's like, positions of maximum opportunity. Yeah. Okay. And all he did, he didn't care about the ball, he didn't care about position. He just wanted huge men to pummel the ball forward and use set pieces, throw-ins, corners, free kicks. I mean, the idea was ultimately undone completely by possession-based teams, but you can look at evolutions of that. Leicester City, a fairy tale. I mean, not just in soccer, but in the world of sports, when they won the league, this team of just absolute discards, they won the team averaging 42% possession, which I think was the third lowest in the Premier League that season. They just attacked so quickly that defenses weren't set and no one could stop them nor keep up with them. But another of your ideas, which I do want to segue into. Can I just say something yeah, on that? Please. One thing that I've, I've noticed that gets, it's really tough and it was true in basketball too. The best coaches with the best players, even in basketball, it was assumed that they were doing things also strategically the best. But it could have been that they just had more talent or that they're superior coaches in, in other aspects as well. And it, we, we for sure have shown that the best teams were not making optimal choices, but people were copying them and thought it was true. I believe that that's very likely happening in soccer, that if you took Man City or Real Madrid and had them play POMOs, I bet with superior talent, they might actually be even better than if they had played the possession-based style. You know, I, I, Sam Allardyce is probably watching this live stream in his underpants somewhere in the middle of England, and I won't apologize. <laughs> you make me eat my words when pumos, <laughs> when they do come back. But another of your ideas that I do want to segue into quickly before we look at some of the barriers um, to data just sweeping into football as if it was just another American sport where we can go uh, in, the, in, the, in the kind of money ball approach. I love one of your ideas. You look at football and you say, what the hell are they doing passing it back to the goalkeeper? It's absolute work. insanity. Okay, so we look at everything as risk reward, right? So 
the best thing that can happen if you pass back to the goalie is you keep possession at some small percentage more. Although I, when I see pass back to goalies against presses, usually the goalie ends up launching it anyway. So it's, you've gained no advantage. But let's say you assume you gain some small advantage of possession, right? So you're basically then, you need to connect like 50 passes to get it to the front, to get to an, to an efficient spot. But then it gets even worse, like the, the coaches, the manager, sorry, they're choosing the goalies based on their, because I, most of them are field players, I think, most of them want the game to be played in this beautiful way, they're choosing them for their feet skills, right? Not for the skill that I think, you can tell me if I'm wrong, like I would want a guy who can, on a certain ball, stop a ball that some other goalie cannot stop. That's what I would want in my goalie. Do I could give. Job. I could give bollocks. Bollocks. I would give bollocks whether they can use their feet. Like, yeah, you just like <laughs> stop, stop the shot. To me, is the thing that I would want. And and like, so let's take, let's take each, like the the defenders, right? They're basically they have the ball and they have a choice. They can pass it back, right? Keep possession slightly, or they can pass it forward. Yeah, you might have a slightly higher chance of losing it. The risk of passing it back is so so high relative to the reward, it doesn't make any sense. But Ted's gonna tell me I'm wrong, I think. I, I won't say that you're wrong, but you, know, you obviously are very smart, and I thought this was a really clever idea last summer, and I was like, well, maybe this is wrong, right? But, but soccer very much worships at the, at the church of Latter-day Pep Guardiola. So it's a, it's a type of thing where when you look the at the- Popovich of- Absolutely. Of I mean, I would work, worship at Popovich's church as well. Or is Guardiola the, po or is Popovich the Guardiola of basketball? <laughs> anyway. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Let me pass it back to the goal. No. Um, so we looked at this analysis and we looked at, we've got a data company. We looked at all of the passes to, uh, back to goalkeepers and uh, for the top three teams anyway. So we would say the talented teams. There were 1,900 passes back to the goalkeeper. And we found that of that sequence set, there were 24 goals that resulted as part of that. And there was one goal against it. And it was a really goofy, chested back pass that Solomon Rondon. Now, obviously, you will say, and with better data, we're not looking at what yeah, the other Yeah, this is where your data is shit. Absolutely. So I, don't, like, I don't agree with you. No, because you're like, it doesn't tell me anything that the top teams are doing it. You, we need to have, when the defender has the ball and they have a marginal choice of passing it back to the goalie or passing it forward, we need to look at the expected goal chain from each of that marginal decision. You have nothing. Actually. Oh, go. You paper, did look at that. A paper this year at your very own conference oh, has incorporated backwards passes, and there's a video that shows that, you know, as they're passing it backwards, when they take it out of a congested space, they're increasing the expected goals as part of the sequence that goes back over here because now they've got space to move forward. And the difference between your game and our game is, like, right. first of all, it's played with feet. Obviously, that's a, a bit of a problem. But the other bit is, like, we have a very small, useful area in front of the pitch, and we don't have threes. So, like, figuring out ways to decompress uh, mm -hmm. and while maintaining possession and switching the ball, which also often involves a deep backwards right. pass, is useful. Now, you can really screw it up, but we went back and we looked at the League One data, so like the third tier in England, which have, often has bumpy pitches, et cetera, and the most uh, goals, <laughs> well, it's true, like there's, there's difficulty in passing, right? We would right. say that you could screw up more often. Yes. So the most goals scored against a team as part of a back pass or an attempted back pass to the goalkeeper were only four. I mean, obviously four is a lot, but nevertheless, right. it, it's, it's an overblown thing. You might be right, though. At some no, point, we might just stop pack, passing back to the goalkeeper. Sounds like I could be wrong. Just kick it into touch. So, soccer, is, that soccer is ultimately a game of creating attacking space. And in passing that ball back, it does lengthen the field, kind of extends the place to attack like an accordion. I've got a feeling that you, Daryl, have been looking in particular a lot at the work of one Joe Hart, who, <laughs> for those who know him, is a disaster. The hero of this of thing. All, Think all. It, Yeah, he's like the Vernon Mad Max Maxwell of soccer. <laughs> but... Before we dive in and look at where the field is, I do want to look at where we are in terms of recruitment, scouting, talk about some of the tactics, but you've already hit upon a couple. There are places where there are barriers to the emergence of stats in the world of football that are unique to the game. You've hit some of them. Um, you know, the, 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 there's an overload of variables, that there's a lack of goals. Um, I mean, in baseball also, and this is changing slightly, the data revolution happened because the data was commonly out there and available. It was in the public domain. Whereas soccer, the data has been, and Ted, you will know this better than I do, it's been often private, incredibly proprietary, most certainly not kind of freely shared 
between clubs. Is that a problem, or is it that our models are too primitive and crude? Well, I certainly think that it's held back the advancement of the game. Like one of the, the amazing things about America is not only were people like huge sports fans and it came from, you know, baseball being a very statistical one had their revolution and it kind of drug all the other sports in together. Um, but part of that, part of being able to do that is having a bunch of very smart brains that have access to useful data. And soccer has not had that. And that's, that's really, it's caused issues with it. So I think that, you know, we're behind, we're way behind. Yeah, and I think if you take it to the extreme, like, so baseball, like, 90% of it can be, like, broken down by data. Some, some super high percentage. Basketball might be next on the spectrum. It's 60, 70, because we have possessions back and forth. You know, soccer's tough. Football's tough. You got 11 on 11. It's continuous. Um, I mean, this is, you know, part of the reason I want to have fewer players on the pitch is because drop, it would make drop, drop that idea it would make the, it would make well I no, I say don't. any no any sport where if you lose a guy and your jo your odds of winning the match doesn't change that with, much with has, a red card has too many damn players right so you got too many player like if you lost a player in basketball you would not have any chance five on four but eleven on ten depends if Sam win. Cassell was still playing or not but I do want to say when when. <laughs> When I saw Darren Murray tweet, tweet this, that soccer has too many damn players, when I picked up the phone and spoke to you, I said to you, ha ha, that's so funny. Are you, when you said it's too many players, you mean the perfect games have five on five. And you're like, no, I really mean soccer has too many players. <laughs> you gave me a long 20 Yeah, long, uh, too long of an answer. But yeah, no, I think that should be a principle. If you lose a player and it doesn't change your outcome much, then you get too many players in your sport. So if it was seven on seven, say, now your data will be easier. Because right, 11 on 11 just makes it harder. It, it does. Uh, so to, to come back to your point, if you lose a player in the first minute of soccer, it's about 0.8 of a goal, which is actually pretty substantial. Now, it doesn't mean See, it guarantees I'm wrong loss. again. No, you're not wrong. This, 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 this is a gambling dumb. question. You're not wrong, though. <laughs> I, I, we, especially as you get into overtimes and stuff or, or extra time, like that might be the area where losing players is interesting because everybody doesn't play for and like, NHL. I would just be too. flopping constantly <laughs> because like, you can lose a player and it doesn't matter. And your penalties are either like, it doesn't matter, or oh my god, you've lost the game. Like you have no penalty between, between like a free kick, whatever, or like you're almost guaranteed to lose a goal. Like we need <laughs> penalty boxes, we need, Sin bins. we need some in between penalty. Like that's a huge issue with the, sorry. You wait for looking at that actually. So they've been listening to you as well. And by the way, Vlad that's Divac that's is not watching my... this on the live stream and nodding, agreeing with you also <laughs> about the flopping. In terms of the data that we have, I mean, we can debate whether it's crude or whether it's developing. What I want to understand is, do we have data that can capture the contributions of a player like Ungolo Kante? Tiny guy, every team he plays, he's like the Ark of the Covenant, every team he <laughs> plays on wins. I mean, he's about five foot seven, league titles, World Cups. He's got a massive motor, he's got positional brilliance. He's incredible tackler, incredible interceptions, but he's almost like a shut down cornerback every team starts to throw away from him. So much of what he does is because of his miraculous awareness of space. Does soccer have the beginnings of data that we can analyze a player and his contribution like in goal? We do now. So inside of your own league, you're able to get tracking data. But the, one of the problems with recruitment, which is a huge thing in, in the world of soccer, is that you don't have tracking data for everywhere else. Um, but what's interesting is the event data w to us was missing the most basic element of defensive ability, uh, which is a pressure. When I close somebody down, it's not necessarily to win the ball right now. It's to actually destabilize that possession, potentially win it back. Uh, so what we can look at is like a top-down model that says, when N'Golo Conte pressures the ball, what happens? And how many pressures is he doing? And what does his engine look like? Which is something that we talk about in football parlance, but it is like, you know, this guy has a big engine, you know, he's, he's got a, a huge motor. So looking at Conte, is, it's amazing. Uh, another guy that comes up is uh, Roberto Firmino up top for, for Liverpool. Bobby Chompers. Yeah, nice. so, so Firmino, uh, you look at him and he's like, he's not a good forward. He doesn't score that many goals. He doesn't set that much up for, for his teammates. He's good, but he's not like great. But the fact of the matter is he sets their press and he sets their defensive element all the time. So when we started looking at Roberto Firmino, like I think we had 723 pressures in like 35 games last year, which is a lot. 
of information about where he's trying to defend the ball. And then 187 times within like five seconds of him pressing somebody, his team won the ball back. So that's a little bit of credit where we're trying to find better ways to say, these defensive players, we know they're super important. Like N'Golo Kante is amazing. How do we figure out how to better measure that and then give that out to the team so they can use that in recruitment? See, that's another thing. I, and some teams, I think, play like this. But I would send someone at someone constantly because of that effect. Now, of course, you have to be massively conditioned and there's probably trade-offs. If but you like, did that, it's PEDS. Like for a 90 minute thing is you, you definitely need some important performance enhancement. It, well, those, are those actually are super advantageous it turns <laughs> out. But, <laughs> but uh, no, but it, that, that's the thing. You, you, you said something interesting about this player. So take, without data, for example, we had a player, Chuck Hayes, would never happen, right? He was a six foot four center where the average size is like 6'11", right? Uh, he couldn't shoot a free throw. He had no chance of making the NBA, except when you looked at the data, you, be, you always went from a, an okay defense to an elite defense when he was on the floor. And so the data is gonna bring new players in, which I think is your point, which is pretty exciting. Like all these downtrodden, less fast, too small, look the wrong way, players are gonna make it into the Premier League. But, by the way, that has particular pertinence for America, where when you're doing your youth development, you always favor the big kids, the athletes, the big units, the little guys, the ones that are developed in Europe always get pushed aside. So that's particularly Absolutely. fascinating. Yeah. So to recap, Bobby Firmino, another great stat, he has 97 teeth and they're all beautiful. <laughs> the, 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 I can't wait for Daryl to take over a Premier League team. Just to recap, they're going to play with five. They're going to flop like motherfuckers. <laughs> and, they're, and, and they're all going to be on peds. <laughs> By the way, I will root for that team, Daryl. I will root for that team. But one, one thing I do want to touch on before we dive in there is a lot of the data analysis that's crept into American sports is because although you are an incredibly capitalist culture, your sports are crazily um, orchestrated. Uh, salary caps. You have economic parity, drafts, rev shares. You know, world football, that's the anarchical beast. You have the incentive here to look for inefficiencies because the financial parity determines that you use your brains. But world football, there is so much money. There's so many piles of cash just wallowing around, particularly for the big teams, which is where you kind of need the innovation. They have the money for it, but they also just buy the cream of talent like apex predators. They just kind of just, if they've got a problem, they solve it with money. So we don't have the kind of same incentive. How much is that a barrier, as you guys see it, to the development of statistics? I think that we're seeing some teams that kind of troughed for a while. Big teams, as you would say, Liverpool's a pretty big team historically that has never won the Premier League. And for- Not won in 29 years? Yeah, uh, for, <laughs> for <Wow. laughs> as an Everton fan over here, is definitely proud to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for three or four years, they were actually like a seventh, eighth best team in, in the Premier League, finishing there regularly. And one of the things that they've definitely done is they've used a lot of data in order to improve their processes. It didn't happen overnight, but they've had enough success that those people have been moved up the chain. Now, obviously, that group, that team, is owned by a baseball owner. So. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a little more buy-in than you might get in the rest of football. You would think the pressure of relegation would be enough to drive a lot of these teams, but I think what you find is what you said is the opposite, and that when you have a franchise in the North American model, you know that your investment will always go towards something great because you're always going to... So you know you're going to be a team in five years, in ten years, so you're... Except if you're the Knicks. They're still a franchise as long as I, <laughs> last I checked, they have 14% chance of being really relevant. Um, so, <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, so based, but, so I think, yeah, knowing you have a franchise has allowed more investment, and to your point, you know, and, and we own a, we own an esports team, and the reality is we, where we're at, soccer is maybe even way behind that, where the data is even worse Right, so we don't know, but you can buy your way out of problems. Like that's that's the issue right now. The the top top players are recognizable in esports, just like they are in soccer. We're trying to like be smart, make smart investments, but we're just not there yet. Yeah, I mean you're in relegation. What do you do? The relegation zone where three teams go down into essentially into the equivalent of AAA baseball. 
you fire your manager and you desperately try and buy a, a, a striker. So that's just the standard operating procedure. Know, you guys fire your managers all the time. What, what's what, and not what's enough happening the, Not enough at the same time. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, the, the, the lack of data, the lack of any analysis, it's always short term it's problem solving. I mean, th this is genuinely fascinating for particularly Premier League clubs where there's so much money and they are relatively large corporations, but the thinking is always short term. It's always, always short term. The, the, you look at Manchester United, a remarkable global brand. It has, a, has an official tractor engine. Uh, <laughs> it has an official potato snack in, 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 in every single corner of the world, a different potato. I mean, it's With a, ketchup on it. A, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is a, it has an official... In the Netherlands, it's mayonnaise. Okay. There yeah. you go. Yes. It, it has a, for every territory, it has its own... Uh, uh, own about 40 products in every territory that are official Manchester United products. But at its helm, in the football performance, there's no long-term vision. What you have is almost an exquisite corpse of a, of a, of a squad <laughs> where one manager after another who's been fired has brought in his favor. Nothing gels. There's no, you, I mean, there's no Daryl. There's no Daryl. Well, at Manchester you, United, you, it's just a manager who's half-time looking at uh, the, uh, uh, recruitment decisions who's pulling the trigger. Well, the why I ask is you don't even need good data to know that the most successful clubs have long-running managers who create a stable environment, recruit to their system, create a whole holistic look of how they acquire, who they pay, everything. Yet. Over there, I see like a new manager, like sometimes three times a year for one club. Which and the manager does not just inform the tactics on the field. The manager for Manchester United is with one hand doing that and still with the other hand signing off on the transfer. Right, which There's is no, another... The director of football is a new idea. Yeah, which is another thing. Like it's, you know, generally, again, there have been successful uh, coach GMs in multiple sports, but the skill sets are so different between my job and I would be a horrible coach. I think Coach D'Antoni would say like, hey, my greatest skill set is not to be the GM. And yet the time horizons are different. The skill sets are different, negotiation, the, you know, and yet it's combined. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, I think we'll know that soccer's moved far once that's, that's separated. And well, standard. It's starting to happen, right? And England's one of the ones that have taken the longest time. Some of the, the clubs on the continent are, are much more comfortable with a director of football model. The coaching issue is, is significant, and, and the coach on recruitment issue is, is a massive one. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're a coach, you spend you know, 50, 60 hours a week, not just on like, the tactical element, but you kind of oversee everything as a head coach, and then you have to do all the press and all that stuff. You don't have time to do recruitment, especially in a worldwide place. When we talk about... Um, the, the data and how it's used, like relegation actually kind of constrains a lot of stuff as well. It, you don't want to get off the teat of the Premier League. Like the, the money train is so good that teams will make terrible decisions in order to avoid this, like casting off at any possible savior. And so it's not just about do we have good information, which we do have better information than we've ever had before, but these teams are now suddenly making suboptimal choices in execution, and that's not necessarily even at the coaching level, that's much higher up. You have to transform like the entire culture of a club to something like you guys did early on in, in basketball, and it's taken you however many years to operate. It took us a long time to get to where we are, yeah. And look at you now on a soccer panel at Slate. <laughs> yeah, ru ruining the soccer panel, yeah, basically. Let's look at where we are, where we are and where we can be in the different facets. The re talk of relegation has naturally moved us towards scouting and recruitment. Ted, I ask you, like, what's the real state of the field? How much data is being used in these multi-million dollar kind of Bryce harper -y transfers that go on on a regular base, uh, basis in football? How good is the soccer world at finding better players for lower prices? And you said to me, if Daryl dived into the world of football right now, he'd have a ton of fun. There's a I, gold rush right now. Absolutely, and, and the nice part is like you can easily quantify your trades. We're not like trying to guess at what the future value of a guy is. I don't need to know what my, my, my first that is lottery protected is going to be three years from now. Uh, we have a easy accounting because players are bought and sold uh, for, for actual values inside of football. I think that if you approached it right now with any sort of bankroll, as you might say, from the trading world, uh, you'd be able to do really well just because, one, you would execute really well. Like, even if the data is fine, it's not good, it's not great, it's fine. 
But you could look at a worldwide mechanism, you could take some economic theory that says that these things are tied and players from here are pretty good and players from here are not. Uh, and then you would you just succeed because it's not that hard right now. It will be much harder in five years. How much money are we talking? Uh, you know. I, <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure you have an owner that's good for it at the very least. Yeah. We, we might have some people that have money in the audience. So. <laughs> I, I want to raise the challenge. I'm, I'm sp now speaking as Daryl's agent. If anybody does want yeah. to bring Daryl onto their football team for peds and flops, speak to me. I launch and squish. I'm trying to go with the launch. It's the future. <laughs> I want, to, I want to raise the challenge of the global nature of the game in terms of recruitment. I was speaking to my mate, Paul Carr, of True Media Networks. You know, if you look at American sports, the NBA, your player pool is what? It's like a percentage of NCAA players yeah, and yeah. a couple of European it's 400, teams. 400, and then there's 6,000 in the NCAA at any given point. Yeah, I mean, the NFL, somewhat si uh, similar. How much of a handicap in this is it that the football pool, I mean, oh, it's... So many leagues. I mean, it's the Croatian league, the Ghanaian league, the Belgian second division, and you know MLS. You've got to look through Mexico, South America. How much is just the global nature of the game, the geographical barrier for scouting, impacting the amount of data that's really going to be useful? It has been significant, and it was a massive deal in the early days. But it also was a big advantage because you look at players from you know disrespected leagues. Uh, French 2 is a great example. French 2 has a lot of very good players playing in a very athletic league, and N'Golo Kante came from there. Riyad Mahrez came from there. Those guys turned into Premier League winners, and they cost peanuts. So when you're able to look at it in the right framework and you've done some research, well, it might take you a year or two to do this, then you can start to, to sort of find the unpolished gems. But you know, from a scouting perspective, that's always the thing that constrains you. I don't know how much time your scouts spend watching guys in a year, but you know, keeping up with just that, you almost have to use data to find guys that are worth scouting or just chucking them out. And that's where we use the horrible radar charts as a, as a really quick uh, heuristic. Yeah, the radar charts got to go. <laughs> but but uh, no, the NBA is totally different, like super sophisticated on the scouting side. But that's because I'm not trying to like toot the horn of NBA clubs. We the pool of people is very finite, right? And and we so the, it's it's a lot easier to identify basketball players like they're tall. They can jump. <laughs> like, it's like you can visually see, like, I call it the mall test. Like, if you, you can be in a mall and you can be like, that guy's an NBA player. Like, it's actually that identifiable. Now, you don't know how good they are, things like that. Uh, so we, we put just incredible amounts of resources into scouting, like, a, a very finite pool. And that's much, yeah, I call it, we, we have, like, we basically have, like, elephant babies. Like, we get one pick a year that we need to nurture for many times, whereas you guys could take soccer and baseball can take sort of a tadpole approach where you get, like, like 500 prospects and just try them all out, basically, which I, I do envy that, actually. So the Undoing Project is a story about you and Joey Dorsey recruitment and stuff like that, and that is actually directly applicable, and we, we've, we've talked about, you and I, behind the scenes, that there are a lot of parallels at, that we were experiencing at the same time. Like we were looking at the Dutch League, and the Dutch League has a lot... Why did you bring up Clint Capella? Why did you go with Joey Dorsey? I'm getting there. <laughs> so, so, so Joey Dorsey, uh, you know, an older player in, in the uh, NCAA cohort, the Dutch League, when guys perform well, you really have to be careful about their age because a lot of them are playing against 18 to 22 year old center backs yes. and suddenly they're cutting through them partly because of physical maturity and much less so because of their ability. You put them in a league that's much more physically strong and has a, has a more normal peak age curve and suddenly they just flop and we see that again and again. So you've got to be really careful about looking at that, which isn't even relative age effect, it's comparative competitive age. So he's, Joey Dorsey was a 25-year-old who won the Na NCAA national uh, title and uh, was absolutely destroying college, and then I stupidly picked him, and he was very pedestrian in the, in the NBA. It was a learning moment. He did go on to dominate Europe, which is almost fits everything. Yeah. The probably the Dutch League. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, the, 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 the Dutch League, you have strikers like Luis Suarez, an elite striking out Barcelona, lighting it up for like 38 goals a season. You also have Josie Altidore lighting it up for 38 <laughs> goals a season. It's almost impossible to tell the difference between the two. Um, who's doing it well? I mean, which teams are using data well in four? You've mentioned Liverpool. Um, I'm from Liverpool. There's two teams in Liverpool. There's Liverpool who are like the Yankees. There's Everton. 
who are like the Mets, but even worse if you can <laughs> imagine. <laughs> Number four, American, American owners, Fenway Sports Group, they, they're grappling with this Premier League problem. What do they do? They are the one club in the Premier League. You know, another American, Jim Palotta, also. Mm -hmm. By the way, Roma and Liverpool played each other in the Champions League semi-final, the, the best tournament in the world. Roma played Liverpool. Unbelievable. They should have played it in Boston. I mean, both Boston-owned teams. Yes. The, the, the American sports ownership, one is a Celtics part owner, mate of yours, uh, another Fenway sports group. Unbelievable the way they've taken to the Premier League. They have about 11 quants that allow them to unearth players like Mo Salah, the Egyptian king. They spent £37 million on him, which is a Filene's basement kind of um, <laughs> amount of money compared to £90 million that United, Manchester United will splurge on the much less effective Romelu Lukaku. But who's doing it well in your mind? I would say it's actually difficult to tell, much like in, in Gerald's, nobody talks, right? Like you're not supposed to talk about how good you are. Liverpool, we're pretty clear, have, have been doing this for quite a long time, actually. So they've, they've been in place, like Dr. Ian Graham and Michael Edwards, since about 2011. So they had a long time to be able to learn and mature uh, as part of that process, and we're seeing the fruits of it now. Um, you know, there are some clubs that, that Arsenal bought uh, an entire data company, StatDNA, uh, but then you hit the wall of, do we know things or are we able to execute on the things? So like if you just have knowledge, it's not useful. If, you have, if you're able to execute it, you have a good process to then implement it and then also to correct the mistakes because it's not perfect work, then that's the important bit. And it's hard to see that from the outside. We mostly just hear about who fails. Is that stage familiar from the MBA in your art? A hundred percent, yeah. I would say obviously the pioneers in the MBA were you know, the, the group that included Jim Pilata came into the Celtics with Grosbeck and was smart enough to get uh, Danny Ainge, a very forward thinking guy, and then hired myself and Mike Zarin, who's still there, and then the owner of the Rockets, who's now uh, moved on, he, <coughs> he brought us in. Like, until you have like very, very senior buy-in with money behind it, you more, it's sad to say, but you more or less have almost nothing. Like, because all the, I've talked to many analysts who've gone to work in the Premier League and they eventually leave. They're like, no one, no one listens to me. One went to Formula One because he was like, they at least listen to me now. Um, so you're going to lose the best people. Uh, you're not going to have the right money behind it. And then at the end of the day, if your coach or manager is not implementing the things you're investing all the money in, the owner is the one who's going to have to tell them, hey, dude, you're gonna, we're either going to do this or we're going to get someone else. And until that moment... It doesn't really happen. There are a couple of Premier League clubs that we see actually, even through recruitment, they're hiring or they're finding pretty good players and they're recruiting them. And then those guys can't get on the pitch. And like, that's a nightmare. And it's not something that the analytics group can ever smooth over. It comes to like the owner and definitely the director of football level to say, we have to find a coach that will then execute and play the players that are good as opposed to the, all the other ones. Is Billy out there saying, well, I'm just gonna trade out all the guys that I don't want you to play anymore so that they're not on the squad. This is one of my quick rants. So uh, if we've learned one thing in analytics across every sport, you get as good of players as possible and then you play them, right? So what is it with soccer where they just all the time don't play their best players? Like punitive they're angry at them i don't i don't get like just randomly i try i play fantasy soccer and i can't tell you how many times like my best dude is just like ah they decided an hour before you're not playing today what's up with that i, I don't understand so, I, we, I, i'd need more specifics to be able to answer that i think you're talking about manchester united and paul pogba and this is a gentleman who has such huge social media numbers that clubs often buy players for that philosophy rather than what they do on the field. And there was... The, the oh, here's a crazy the, one. That's your short-term manager who doesn't want that player. The, 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 the battles, the political yeah. battles meant the best players seem to be on the bench there uh, for a prolonged period of time. But Didn't often in football, it's just so... If they play well in Asia, where the clubs are trying to grow their brand, then they get on the squad. Whether they get onto the field is a different matter. Didn't a top player, and I, got, I don't remember who, maybe you remember, get benched because he liked a comment on Instagram that said something about the manager that was slightly negative. Do you remember this? That's so many players. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know what to tell you. To that's me, that, to me, that's, just, to me James that's just Har conventional imagine wisdom. Imagine James Harden yep. scored 58 yesterday. Yep. <laughs> imagine he liked 
a post that said, hey, Coach D'Antoni didn't run the right play at the end of the game. Do you think he would not be playing the next game? Let's try it. I would like <laughs> James Harden, if you're out there, James, watch your general manager, and you see a post which says announce house, which is a deep cut Houston Rockets joke. <laughs> Just like it and see what happens. I'm sure you'll be on the bench for the next game, too. It's common wisdom. It makes complete sense. It's a good way to shut me up, too. We're, we're yeah, English. But... We hate ourselves. We hate success. Where would we play our best players, for God's sake? <laughs> Last question on recruitment. It's a quick one for you, Ted. Is there any metric by which Christian Pulisic, the American from Hershey, Pennsylvania, who was brought from Dortmund by Chelsea for $70 million, <laughs> is there any metric that I'm not aware of that says, yes, he's worth that money. He was super exciting two years ago. I think that we've seen him not progress at the same level that you would hope, but development isn't like a linear path, like you get rocky bits. Uh, he's an excellent ball mover, so good dribbler, uh, and he's good at creating for his teammates. From a coaching perspective, if you were going to coach him down and give him analytics data-driven coaching, you want him to get into the box a little more and be able to take central shots, increase his shot volume. It's not bad because he's so young and he's playing in a pretty good league, but 70 million was probably an overpay, which was pro I heard behind the scenes was based on the fact that they had a transfer ban coming up and they wanted to make sure that they got that deal in before the, the problem Is hit. the radar chart fat for Pulisic? No, it's a bit pointy and skinny. It's but. Pointy, but that could be fine too. <laughs> well, it could you be. can't really tell the difference. And the branding, that was a long-winded way of saying no. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would say you said the two years, I don't know anything, but I can tell you from my sport, if a guy for two years stagnates, that, yeah, they can still advance, but it's really going to put a lid on and a floor on where they're going to be. So. The, the, the coaching behind the scenes, Dortmund, probably causes some problems as well. If you, if you knew that you had a, a good development coach there that was teaching him the right things, then that would be great. But they've been up and down, gone through a couple managers, and that will also stunt player growth. It's almost impossible right now, especially when teams like hate their manager, to divorce team performance from what the manager is doing to it. So and the coach is effing them. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, look, look at Manchester United. We predicted going into this season that we had no idea what would happen because it's Mourinho year three. You already knew that there were problems behind the scenes. And there, it, it widens the spectrum of where they could finish from like bottom half, despite having the most expensive team in the world. And, but they could still end up at like third, which is a pretty big deal. Pulisic, worth 70 million just for branding to America. We wouldn't be talking about him if, uh, about Chelsea and Pulisic if they had not spent that money. A lot of that money was for the American market and just to make sure he gets regular mentions at the Sloan Conference. But tactically, <laughs> are there inefficiencies in football? Absolutely. Soccer, like in the NBA, the three-point shot. And you, you, Darryl, I'm fascinated for you, you've talked a little bit about position, possession, but what fundamental flaws exist in soccer tactically that can be exploited by those managers who have the data and actually use it? Uh, the set pieces stuff was, was almost a qualitative analysis, but what we did was we proved with our Danish club, and this was Matthew Benham, the owner's idea. He's like, look, I think this is really it could be really effective and we need to study this. We know that there have been teams, there's actually this coach named Gianni Vio in Italy who had great success doing this. He came up from like the tiniest pub leagues in Italy and just gradually kept moving up. And he's got all these different thoughts and theories about how can we improve this? Because you know, most clubs, when I would go talk to them, spent 10 minutes a week, not, not a day, a week on this thing that actually yeah, accounts for about 25 to 30% of goals. You're talking about set pieces, these are corners, free kicks, essentially controllable situations. Absolutely, and, and so we spent time figuring out sort of best practice, and you know, it's, it's a very detail-oriented thing. How do we analyze the opposition in order to increase the effectiveness of this? Should we recruit? It's not the most important thing when we recruit, but it's a nice added benefit of it. And, uh, and we took them, you know, the average team scores about a third of a goal a game. Like, we took Michelin, who've consistently scored uh, about three quarters of a goal a game, so 0.75, which when you think about it in the Premier League, like, that would be something like 10 to 15 goals over a season, a goal's worth 2.5 million. Like, that's a huge amount of money, and it's coming from coach analyst level and not really player level. Players are useful in this, but it's a strategy execution. You need three-point shooters. And then, you can, if you can find athletes that you can then train to shoot three-pointers, that's hugely useful to you as well. Why, why aren't teams th treating throw-ins on the other end as a freaking set piece, then, if it's that important? It is, and, and we've started to score off of long throws, but the problem with this is 
Who's so, we? Are you like all of soccer? No, no, no. Sorry, I, I Mitchell End. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Okay, sorry. So, so, so Mitchell End score from long throws. Uh, Horsens, <laughs> Dan, like Denmark, really likes long throws now. Uh, it, Iceland also apparently likes long throws, especially in Europe. Uh, so, so we've started to incorporate that. The problem there mm. is that there's like one long throw coach in the world, and he now works at Liverpool. How hard can this be? Thomas it, Grunemo. Exactly. It's a throw. But I can like, tell you, the, 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 the why it is is part of where soccer is at the moment, and that illuminates it more than anything. When Liverpool Football Club hired this throwing coach, Thomas Grunemark. So they have a throwing coach? They were mocked and derided. I mean, absolutely, it was, it, was, it was hilarious to the world of football. But the truth is that throw-ins in football are the quickest way to see possession. I think 50% of the time in these throw-ins, which happen all bloody game long, the other team actually takes control of the ball. And Grunemark has this flat, direct throw that he tries to, that's his trademark, which changes that. It's given Liverpool a crucial advantage. Oh, so no we, one's talking about it. We actually, I think, and I'm going to throw this out there, and 10 years from now, you're going to tell me an idiot, and that's fine, because that's normal. Um, so we think that with the way that we've got long throws right now, even the top level, we're not executing it properly. If you have your wide players and you've got the offside line, you cannot be offside on a throw. And so if you've got two fast guys wide, you can pick up the ball quickly, you can skim it on the ground. Like, the defense cannot cope with that. So if you start executing that strategy regularly, if they drop deep, then they suddenly open the entire center of the pitch, which is the most valuable area. This is a thing that we think FIFA at some point might change the law on. I was going to say, they're going to change the rule. Yeah, I exactly. Promise you. you'll, 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 you'll break it for a while, about five years, people they get sick of it. They keep changing the rules on James Harden, so they're <laughs> going to change the rules on you. See, so. bas basketball's always the, the forerunner for us. We just steal things, and including changing the rules. I mean, I'm fascinated, are the, from basketball, are the wisdoms in soccer that just seem plain wrong to you, Daryl? I mean, you talk to me about the core question for every NBA coach, the core choice. Do you crash the boards when you take a shot or do you immediately have your players retreat? Yeah, there's two, two, two things that we know that teams are choosing super suboptimal. The largest one is really well-known, three-pointers. Like when the, when the line first came in, coaches were actively coaching against it, right? And we now, of course, know that was... Not only wrong, it was like 10 to 15 wins wrong, like just catastrophically wrong. Offensive rebounds is like another one. Like many, many of the top teams choose not to offensive rebound, they just choose to defend. There's been many great Sloan papers showing that that's suboptimal. And yet it, it propagates because the, the top coaches who win do it. Like, but it doesn't make it the right choice. And just so, just because Pep you know, plays through the goalie, it does not make it the right choice to do that. Now, maybe it sounds like there's better data, so I might be <laughs> wrong, but it's fine. I mean, is there a common wisdom that you know is completely wrong in soccer? So we, it's, it's probably a bit less impact of offensive rebounding, but it's a similar vein in that coaches will still put guys on the post uh, when they're defending corners. Oh, yeah. And when we look at that, we're like, well, first of all, that doesn't stop them from scoring through them. Often, like, the ball just goes past them because they can't react in time. And second of all, if we know that we want to run regularly, we need those guys to potentially be up the pitch. If, if we're not here, we can either over, overload the defensive zone that we're trying to defend, or we can create more counterattacks. And that counterattack is exactly what you're talking about. It's a little bit of risk, or at least perceived risk, but if we get an extra goal, say, once out of every 10 games, like, that gets us up the table, and it, it's actually quantifiable, because we know that there's like win bonuses and point bonuses in the league, so we could do that, but it's, it's really getting it down to the pitch. Well, it would be better challenge. to have them on the post. If you had to choose between the post or just standing them in the goal, <laughs> like, who might be able to head it away, which one's better? Yeah, you want, to be, you want them to generally be like at the edge of the six, and then you want a couple of guys for out balls that, that are just ready to run up the pitch. At least that's my opinion, but. Oh, and the opinion of stats. Sometimes. And you, I'm fascinated by the place of the opinion of individuals who are data analysts within football, because right now the big clubs, they do have data analysts, Arsenal, Roma, Liverpool. I mean, everybody has a data Everybody in the pre very few of the clubs actually listen to them. I mean, there's a mound of opposition research that is developed by quants guys for every single game. How much is actually being used? And are coaches even prepared to, are the players even mentally conditioned to receive it right now? No, I think the, the, that's, I mean, the player population is very different. Some guys love to see it, and you know, we had a guy named Tim Sparv up at Michelin that's like still involved in it. I think he'll become a coach and like just loves it. But you know, there are other players that want nothing to do with it. And the coaching thing, 
You know, it's like lipstick on a pig, you know? It doesn't make the pig more attractive. It's just like, you know, you end up making everybody angry as part of it. If coaches don't want the analytics, we can't force that on them. And, and this is where, you know, I, I gave a presentation last year talking about Daryl being a king. Like, if the coaches don't want to do what Daryl wants them to do, he has the opportunity to move them along. That doesn't exist in football because there's too much power and that it's not a, it's a different structure. So is that how you've changed that in the NBA? How you've solved that problem just by... I think it's more the owners who are setting the tone of like, we're gonna have this as our differentiating philosophy. We're gonna use data to, to win games. But uh, yeah, I mean, at some point, someone needs to say, this is the way we're gonna plan to do things. Uh, we don't think about it as kings or shooting people, but um, apparently Ted does. <laughs> um, we don't have guns in England. I think there's you have five a, minutes. So the, there's an amazing that. piece in the um, Financial Times today by Simon Kuiper, who looks at their Barcelona stats team. They have a hub, an innovation hub. I think um, some of their uh, leadership are at this conference. Um, and they asked one of the data analysts, it's like a big prestige thing. They're, they're with the Golden State Warriors one minute, with, with the 49ers the next. They've invested a lot of money. It's really groundbreaking. And they asked one of the data analysts, they said, how much do you actually contribute in a, to a Barcelona win? And the data analyst, he said, um, if I'm being honest, about 0.01%, <laughs> which, is, which is genuinely heartbreaking. So we all just have a tear right now, is that? Um, he, he, his answer was 0.0%, but then he uh, quite a push, so he, uh, so he up to the tiny tick. But I do want to project a happier future to close. I mean, baseball became a game of homers, walks, strikeouts, your three true outcomes. Basketball became a game of threes and layups. NFL, a high-flying passing league. When data analysis does grip soccer properly, properly, what kind of a game will it become? Well, you see a lot of set pieces. And the nice part about set pieces is that like, you can actually manage your game time. So it's, it's often an underdog strategy. We think of Sam Allardyce you know, battering people, Tony Pulis as well. But if you have good teams that start to take that, like, that actually is a, it makes it think it's very difficult for a team to deal with you in the final third because like, there are no good options. If we give them a throw in, it's a long throw. If we give them a corner, then like, you know, they're, they're, they're running specific routes, like NFL style routes to be able to, to find advantages. I think we'll see more counters, like more aggressive, slightly open. But you will, like, so one of the things that doesn't work in basketball that does work in soccer is this pressing style. Like, you cannot high press effectively in the NBA because... I, 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 no one has done it successfully. I actually don't eliminate it as a strategy. Fair enough. Patino was the last guy to do it with the Celtics, actually. And in, in soccer, it is one of the strategic like, no, ways... Oh, it's awesome. I've been like, oh, my God, finally, people are doing things that make sense. They're getting them in their end. <laughs> they're trapping them. They're not assuming everyone's going to make a bunch of bets. They're waiting for the mistakes and attacking. Like, it, I've, I've been... I was so, that development's given me hope. Well, and I think right. Liverpool's style, where they've got a lot of pace in the front line and they've got guys that can play it long, I, that's also a thing that's going to consistently happen. It changes your wide players, but then you, in football, we end up with suboptimal players all the time. Like, but here's you know, what I've noticed. So the pressing is good. Yeah. So basically, it was figured out pretty early that threes and layups are better on offense, but then the defenses did not adjust. I, so I see the same thing. They figured out, oh, we'll do this press in their end, but it needs to change how you defensively play as well. Yeah. And they're still trying to intricately pass through these pressing when maybe, yeah, I mean, we've talked about it. Poma, or whatever that, whatever you're thinking. Puma, Tom. Puma, Puma, I Puma, guess. you gotta yeah, spit yeah. it out a little bit more and have some pie on the corner of your mouth fleck out when you spit it out. <laughs> Essentially, football's gonna be a game of high pressing throw-ins in the future, and five players aside, if Daryl has his way. <laughs> gonna take a, rules. We're gonna take a couple of quick questions. Great one to start with, with Sir Alex Ferguson, uh, and now Arsene Wenger, both of whom were at their clubs for over 20 years, gone. Do you think the long-term manager being dead in soccer means that long-term strategy using analytics becomes less feasible? Really, case for your director of football. It's much more so an ownership decision, as Daryl's saying. It's got to come from the top down. I think that looking at how City Football Group work, like they're going to keep Pepe around for a long time, and analytics will help him operate better. It won't necessarily help them save any money. Because <laughs> like people just charge them whatever they can. Uh, so I, I think, but one thing that, that happens in football right now is like so many guys get cleared out with the manager, and that's institutional knowledge. I'm sure that you guys hate to lose guys that have been around for a while that have really good knowledge, because it costs your organization a lot. Yeah, whenever you have success, and Golden State's been through it, we've been through it, you know, our best people get sort of zapped away, so. Question for you guys. All the questions have just wiped out. How does MLS 
compare to the level in Europe. We're very high tech of data here. usage. Yeah, the video is going to kick on in a minute. Go on. <laughs> um, what, uh, how does MLS compare in terms of its usage to Europe? Much less so, and part of that's a, a budget constraint. Like, the money just isn't there. Uh, money for data can easily be spent on players or potentially more coaches for the academy, which is a big push for, for the United States. Um, the USSF has a huge, interesting program where they are now data tracking, like, U15 on up, and that's the first time that's really been done at a wide scale. We know almost nothing about youth football. Like, I disagreed with some of the stuff on the, on the panel earlier this morning. Like, that's just not happening. And it will be very valuable because we will learn how players develop and what they can develop into. But it's also going to be very choppy. And you need to invest in that properly at the country level to have enough information to make decisions on it. Last question from me. It's really from Billy Bean, most regular guest of all time on Men in Blazers. He's the Alec Baldwin to our show for <laughs> Saturday Night Live. I was going to interview Jurgen Klopp recently. And I, he asked this question that he wanted me to ask Jurgen. It's really essentially about whether managers matter at all in football, which differentiates it from the other sport. I'm going to ask you both. If you owned a team for 10 years, and I could get you 10 years of the greatest manager ever, Sir Alex Ferguson, to be your manager at his best, or 10 years of Lionel Messi at his best, the best player in the world, which would you choose? <laughs> That's such an easy answer. <laughs> Well, Messi, of course. Come on. It is How much do I have to pay him? Yeah. That's, <laughs> is it that's zero? Fine. Do I get him for zero? Managers is like a U-curve, though. There's this whole group in the middle that don't matter. And then, like, really good managers matter quite a bit. And really bad managers quite a bit. But there's a giant selection bias in there that says that the really get, bad guys get chucked out. And the really good guys then move on to much higher paying jobs. So I'd say this. Yeah, Billy hates managers. So this is, like, an unfair <laughs> question. He, he literally, like, would rather have a tree stump run his team, he's told me, I think. So... <laughs> So, so, no, he, so it's wrong. It's, it's definitely wrong. So over 10 years, which is why I like you asked 10 years, but then you said Messi, like yeah, Messi we knew like a mid-tier player. But, but they, they have incredible influence over 10 years. It's not just the tactics you see on the field. It's, you know, who you recruit, who you hire, who like, it, it, it's, they're, they're massively important and influential uh, over a 10-year time horizon, over maybe one year, it's not as big of an impact as you like. That's, that's why it's very puzzling that they change managers so much over there to me. The right answer is, at the end of the day, the general manager. The general. <laughs> that's what we need. 10 years of the greatest general manager in his pomp. Darryl, are you saying Ted? Or? What? I'll take both of you on this team. <laughs> what did he call the team that we're going to buy? The, the launch and squish. There you Football go. God club, love. Yeah. That, is, that is the one great outcome from this panel. <laughs> I will be a very happy man. Well, thank you, thank Ted. You, yeah. You're a beautiful bloke. Daryl, you are a king to football, to numbers, and all who sail in them. Thank Should you. Should we run the video at the end? Yes, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, Sarah. Hey, thanks. Sarah. That was awesome. Run, run the video at the end. Why not? Hey, how you doing? This is Ted Lasso. I'm the new head coach of the Tottenham Hot Spurs, and uh, I'd like to talk to the Queen, please. My name's Ted Lasso. I'm new head coach for Tottenham Spurs. Been brought over here to, to you know, implement my coaching style. Football's football, no matter where you play it. You got grass, you got cleats, and you got helmets with masks on them. Football in the States is my specialty, but they have a different kind of football over here. Kick it! Circle them up, have them put on their pads, and let's start playing for real. They're wearing their pads, coach. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of small similarities. A team I coach, they're going to play hard for all four quarters, OK? Uh, two halves. What's that? Two halves. OK, halves. They're going to play hard for two halves. And we're going to play till there's a winner and there's or a loser. A tie. What's that? A tie. OK, till there's a winner, a loser, or a tie. You can tie. Oh, that was fun. Hey, appreciate it.